Welcome back, fellow adventurers, to a brand new video. And today we are covering section three of Swords and Wizardry with Professor Ben. If you are unfamiliar with this series, I am going through the Swords and Wizardry complete rulebook, and I am teaching you how to play Swords and Wizardry. Click the card above to catch up. We are now on episode three, where I'm talking about choosing your class. Also, a really cool thing that's going on right now is if you are a fan of old school gaming, this is like the best time for you. Fraga Games is presenting a humble bundle in which you get over $600 worth of old school gaming content for at most $18. Now this also goes to benefiting a charity. So basically you're getting a ton of gaming content for super cheap while helping those in need. This is a win-win win because you get to watch this video too. In that Humble Bundle, there's a ton of Swords and Wizardry stuff. So if you're really digging this series or digging Swords and Wizardry in general, I highly recommend picking that up. There's also some awesome content for Castles and Crusades, Astonishing Swordsmen and Sorcerers of Hyperborea, Victorious, a steampunk RPG system. So basically, if you're a fan of the old school, check out the top link in the description to get all of that for super cheap. If you do enjoy this video anytime, please leave me a like. It helps out a lot. And comment down below something you learned or the class that you chose to play your next character as. Subscribe for more content because one once we reach 1,000 subscribers, there's gonna be that awesome giveaway. Oh God, that's the bell. Class is starting. All right, now that everyone's taken his or her seat, we may begin class. Okay, so ironically, talking about starting class, we are choosing our character's class today. Now, in my opinion, this is always the, probably the hardest part of character creation, uh, if you don't have it planned out ahead of time. Um, usually when I think of a character, I think of the personality sort of, um, you know, what, I, how I really want to play this character, whether it's going to be sort of a gentle, kind character or a more aggressive, you know, in your face kind of guy. Um, from there, it's pretty easy to pick your class. Uh, so just going to go straight down the list, uh, here. First off, we have assassin. So assassins are a subclass of thieves. Now being a subclass of thief you get to roll on the thieving abilities, or the, the thieving skills. Uh, so basically, at level 3, you're going to start gaining abilities like climbing walls, delicate tasks and traps, so, you know, disarming or messing with traps in any way, hearing sounds, hide in shadows, move silently, and opening locks. So you are very versatile when you play uh, thief, or in this case, assassin. Um, it just happens to be that assassins uh, can easily... Uh, apply poisons, but we'll get in that in a second. I want to note real quick that the prime attribute uh, is dexterity, strength, and intelligence, all 13 plus. When it says 13 plus right there, that means you have to have a 13 in order to be an assassin in those three categories. Um, do that with that what you will. Um, some referees may keep that, some may throw it away and say, you know, it really doesn't matter. Uh, say you have a 12 in dex or a 12 in strength, it's close enough for them. Um, yeah, do that, that what you will. Uh, hit dice, you get 1d6, so you're like moderately beefy, I guess. Um, you know, not too great. Leather armor only, you can use shields, which is kind of cool. Any weapons, uh, and only humans may be assassins. Uh, as assassins, you usually want to be neutral or chaotic. So pretty passive or very strongly um, in the chaotic nature. Um, moving down, you get a disguise ability. Uh, basically where you can disguise yourself. Uh, that's It's more so for disguising in places where someone wouldn't recognize you as a specific person, uh, if that makes sense. Magic items and poisons. Okay, here's the cool part. You can use poisons on your weapons without the risk of making basic errors. For example, fighters might coat their sword in a poison, but then accidentally might rub their eye right afterwards. Uh, whereas assassins are properly trained, so none of these basic errors happen. Here's your experience chart, as well as your saving throw right there. There it also shows you how many hit dice you get. Um, at a certain level, you just get plus one, plus two, plus three HP. You, you don't roll your hit dice anymore. Um, and then at level 21 plus, if you ever get a character up that high, um, there are specific rules for that. Uh, you get your thieving skills. Also, backstab. Very, very cool ability. Assassins may attack from behind to hit with a two hit bonus of plus four and inflict double damage. So that's on uh, behind a target. And, and generally how backstab is ran, uh, at least in my game, is you have to be backstabbing something that can be backstabbed. For example, like a construct, um, which doesn't specifically have weak points from behind. Uh, I don't apply backstab to that. Uh, like always, anything that I say, do it, fit what you will. Um... 
Ba, 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 ba. You can establish a guild at 14th level, so basically harboring a bunch of assassins, uh, and you become the guild master of them, which it, which is pretty pretty darn cool. Um, that's pretty much it on assassins. Um, the original rules did not provide any automatic kill ability for assassins, other than four hired assassins as a way of determining success or failure on a mission. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, the only way to actually instantly kill something is if your double damage really did that much damage. Um, I think that is pretty good for Assassin. Basically, you are thieves who can use poison. Uh, but I will note later on that the Assassin thieving chart is not as good as the thief chart itself. Um, basically, these skills are even easier to do as a thief, um, but they're not as easy to do as an Assassin because you get some other cool stuff like the poisons. Um, moving on to Cleric. So these are warrior priests or priestesses who serve law or chaos. Primarily, they serve a deity where they get their power from, or his or her power from. Um, and they, they generally have a cathedral or a temple to which that they follow in order to interact with uh, the common folk or other acolytes um, that may be practicing you know, this, this field as well. Uh, the prime attribute is wisdom. Definitely need a high wisdom. Um, you get 1d6 per level. Any armor and shield is permitted. Uh, weapons. Weapons, you may only use blunt. Okay, let's let's talk about that for a second, because in some other editions you can use any weapon. I'm a big fan of the blunt, um, mainly because it, when I s imagine clerics going into fight, they're fighting on behalf of their deity or their patron. Um, so if they do have to fight, um, they don't want it to be uh, too gruesome of an outcome. Is basically what I'm getting at. No missile weapons other than oils or slings, if the referee permits it. Kind of cool. And you can only be a half-elf or human. We talked about that a lot in the last video of races. If you missed that, um, go check that out for sure. It's in the playlist. Uh, you get spell casting as a cleric. Um, so many of these are going to be divine spells, so so uh, healing and, and supportive spells in that sort of nature. Another really cool thing you can do is banish the undead. Um, you can turn monsters. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the comment or the, the comments, <laughs> the combat section. Uh, but basically what you do is um, you can make undeads and, you know, undead monsters fear away from you. So they're going to, like, run away in terror. That's if you successfully do it. Uh, if you're playing a chaotic cleric, um, it's possible that the undead aren't even affected uh, because you sort of serve that evil, that chaos. Uh, saving throw bonus, plus two on all saving throws against being paralyzed or poisoned, which is pretty awesome. Uh, religious stronghold at ninth level, uh, you can create a stronghold to attract, you know, men at arms or people who swear loyal, uh, to the same patron or deity that you are also swearing to. So you go use your experience chart, your hit dice, which is again, D sixes, um, saving throw gets easier to make it as you go down, obviously. And then here's your spell chart. So this is going to tell you the number of spells by level. Um, so at first level, you actually get no spells. Second level, you get that first level spell, and so on and so forth, all the way down. So those are pretty simple. Uh, cleric is sort of your healer, um, to put it in simple terms. That's generally what their their um, their point is. <laughs> druids. Now, druids are super cool and have always been a favorite of mine. Um, druids are part of a mysterious religious order. Uh, generally, priests are priestesses again. However, they don't specifically serve the light or the darkness. They serve nature and the powers of nature that binds sort of the worlds together. Um, Druids are often, uh, you know, if we were going to give them a very simple definition, to be kind of like tree hugger. Uh, they really like nature, animals. Um, you can cast spells to talk to wildlife or even make um, them your allies. Uh, they pull characteristics from fighters, clerics, and magic users all together, so it's pretty awesome. Generally, their uh, home base is going to be sort of like a citadel in the forest um or, or some other construct um that that is out in generally reclusive area that's kind of a big point that i like to talk about druids as is druids sort of operate on their own terms to what is best for the world the world survival um and i, I don't mean the world of mankind i mean the world itself you know the living breathing atmosphere that is these earths um wisdom and charisma are both really important you want 13 plus in both of those um Hit dice, D6 again, a lot of D6s. Uh, leather, armor, and a wooden shield. 
Weapons permitted are dagger, sickle sword. Treat is a short sword. Um, sling, oil, and spear. So pretty straightforward. Pretty normal. Only humans may be druids. Only humans may be druids. Kind of a big, big point there. Um, druids must begin with neutral alignment. That is sort of a big thing. Um, however, you know, character progression might warrant um, you going into law or chaos specifically itself. The mistletoe is a sprig. A sprig of mistletoe serves a druid much as a holy symbol is for clerics, but is even more important. Oh, hello, cat. Uh, um, druid hierarchy is a big thing. Um, basically, as a druid, you want to work yourself up the hierarchy and different spots in the hierarchy can earn you different rewards. So you can see the entire uh, hierarchical standing in their big chart that they have, along with their experience, hit die, saving throw. And then their number of spells is baked into that as well. Um, druids can cast spells, as you as you can see. They're prayed for um, in order to get them. Uh, druids gain a plus two saving throw against fire, um, which is pretty cool. Um, then this is where your mystery sort of um, come in. Um, at second level, a druid learns varying abilities to the character. The second level druid can determine whether water is pure, identify a type of normal plant by sight, smell, or taste, and easily move through non-magical undergrowths, including thorns and heavy vines. Um, so basically, druids start to become more individualistic. You know, not a lot of other um, character classes are going to have cool stuff like that. Shape change is awesome as well. You can literally turn into a, a black bear, a crow. Um, this is sort of how I've always ran this is it's really up to your referee how you can shape change and what effect it actually has and, and what abilities you can get from it. Um, you get immunity to fey uh, charms at fifth level. Pretty cool. So, you know, like dryads, satyrs don't affect you. Any fey creatures, basically. Uh, you can use magic items that clerics can. Secret language, you get to uh, speak druidic, um, which only druids know, generally. Maybe it would be kind of cool if, if you introduced an NPC that speaks druidic, uh, but isn't a druid. Hmm, I wonder how they learned druidic. That could be a fun little uh, adventure as you go. Uh, the stronghold at 11th level is when you can you know make that to gain your supporters and have a base of operations, basically. So druids are pretty straightforward. Um, they're, they're the folk of the nature. Um... Biter is up next, the warrior, basically the meat shield. <laughs> um, uh, fighters are pretty cool. You want high strength, the D8, so you're pretty beefy. Um, any shield, any weapons, and any race, they are the most versatile class as far as just like raw hand-to-hand -hand comic goes. Um, against creatures with one hit dice or less, a fighter makes one attack per level each round, so you can attack more than once basically as a fighter. Um, you also get to parry. Um, so parrying, you can run in a couple different ways. Personally, if I, how I run parrying sometimes, um, is you're not always parrying. You have to declare it. Um, and when you declare it, uh, you know, at the start of the round, uh, the enemies have a penalty to attack. So they have anywhere from minus one to minus five penalty to hit you. Um, how I've can, kind of had fun with it in the past is because you're so focused on parrying, you also get that minus to um, to your um, to hit. Not a lot of people do that. Um, just a little way for a referee to do it different if you would like. You also get those strength bonuses if you have a high strength, and you get a stronghold um, at ninth level, so pretty early on. Now, fighters really don't have anything else is because they're mainly focused specifically on, on being very versatile in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, that's pretty much it for fighters. I mean, they're, they're pretty cut and dry. You know, if you're looking to play someone who swings a swings a, a sword in, with a shield with it, that's fighters you're, is definitely where you want to go. Magic users. Magic users are very, very cool for uh, spellcasting. They're basically your sorcerers, your mages. Uh, your people who are going to be throwing the fireballs. <laughs> um, their arcane knowledge is very vast. Um, they are often philosophers, uh, very very intelligent people. Um, at some point, they become archmages. So basically, you're you're some of the most powerful and intelligent people in the land. They often have a role in in politics um, and influence of kingdoms because you know they just have such great power and experience and wisdom around them. Um, 
intelligence. You want to have a high intelligence for sure. 1d4, so you are super weak and you cannot wear armor. <laughs> Stay in the back if you are a magic user. You get daggers, staves, and darts. Elves, half-elves, and humans may be magic users. Um, I really like elf magic user. That's, that's kind of my favorite. Like I said, I think in the past video, is elven magic user was always my favorite. Um, magic user fighter, or fighter magic user, was always sort of my favorite way to go. Uh, even today in this day in 5th edition when I play that um, I, I make a variant, I, I use multi-classing um, so magic user can cast spells obviously <laughs> in Swords and Wizardry a beginning magic user spell book contains as many as 8 basic first level spells um, check each so I'll explain that in a second uh, basically you have a maximum number of spells um, and a minimum number um, to, to spells that you may have um, so saving throw bonus plus two on all saving throws, uh, against spells, including spells from magic wands and stabs, obviously because you are so experienced with said magic that you have a better defense against it because you know a lot about it at 11 level is when you get your personal stronghold, which is a wizard's tower. Um, you gain the title of wizard as well, which is super cool. Wizards arrive always when they mean to. <laughs> Um, uh, so basically you get libraries, laboratories, pa place to study and, uh, maybe even experiment a little bit if you're feeling crazy about it. Um, here's your chart. So the number of spells by level that you can learn all that fun stuff, magic users, again, basically your mages, they're going to be casting the most amount of spells and having the fun that way. Monks, cool monk, man, I, I do not see a lot of people playing monks. Um, but they're, they're basically very enlightened hand-to-hand -hand combat fighters. They're the martial artists. They're the one who are, who are punching you in your, <laughs> in your pressure points and, and send you in, into death, basically, that way. Um, wisdom, you want a 13. Um, yeah, they, oh, let me also mention this, because they, they can be very powerful. They're extremely powerful character class, and sometimes referees won't even allow them. Um, so you need a 13 wisdom, 1d4, so you are weak, but you can wear any armor, all weapons, and only humans, maybe monks. Uh, monks are usually disciples of law. I've also seen the argument that monks should be neutral um, because they're so in balance with themselves and the world that they just sort of remain stalwart and, and neutral. Um, only humans can be monks again. Charity, all treasures other than the bare minimum of what is needed to uh, survive it must be donated to charities. Um, monks can also only use potions. Uh, cannot, or sorry, <laughs> cannot use potions. Uh, they can use uh, weapons or magic rings. So here we go. Here's here's where they they can get kind of strong, and I'm gonna try to try to explain this the best I can, um, because they again are very strong if they if if all goes well. <laughs> Staying alive though is kind of the hard part. You are pretty squishy. You get a weapon damage bonus. Monks inflict an additional point of damage at second level when using weapons, and this increases every other level. Plus two at fourth, plus three at sixth, up to a maximum of plus five at tenth level. So that's very strong. Um, Deadly Strike. When the monk's attack roll is higher than five, uh, is five higher than the required number to hit, the target has a 75% chance to be stunned by the blow for 2d6 rounds. So when your attack roll is Five higher than required, you can you can possibly stun them. Moreover, the mystic perfection of the blow has a 25% chance to kill that opponent, provided that the opponent's hit dice is no more than one higher than the monk's. So you have not only a chance to stun them straight out, is you also have a chance to just kill them. There's that one-shot mechanic that we were talking about earlier with assassins. <laughs> so very strong. Multi-attack, uh, when fighting without weapons, the monk gains additional attacks during a single melee round. Um, so going through here, you get your specific armor class per level. Um, you get your saving throw, experience, and hit dice. Um, at first level, you're going to get your thieving skills, which is down there. Oh, obviously your movement rate increases as well, so you get pretty quick. <laughs> plus one damage with uh, weapons. You can speak with animals, and then you get plus two. Um, and then basically, as you level up, you get all of these 
crazy abilities. So uh, right off the bat, you get alertness. Um, a party containing a monk is unlikely to be surprised, only one in six chance. You can deflect missiles, slow fall, so you can uh, basically not really take falling damage uh, from certain heights. Uh, plus two to saving throws. You get to speak with animals, normal animals, that is. Um, mastery of the silence, monk can enter a state of perfection. Perfection, um, perfect catatonia. Um, stopping his or own heartbeat to simulate death, the character can maintain the state for 1d6 times 10 minutes times the monk's level. So you can kind of stay, quote unquote, play dead, you know, for, for kind of a while there. Um, mastery of the mind, the monk, uh, his thoughts become so serene and placid that any attempt at mind reading has a 90% chance at failure. Mastery of the body, the monk can heal itself 1d6 plus 1 hit points per day. Pretty cool. Master yourself. The monk is not subject to mental control of any kind, including the charm spell and hypnosis. The only exceptions are the quest and Gaius spells. Or Gaius, however you say it. I know it's always said, said differently. And then once you hit 10th level, you are not subject to those spells at all. At 11th level, you can get your monastery and have your disciples and students. And at 13th level, you get harmonic touch. The monk can touch any creature of equal or lesser hit dice and create an attunement by which the creature will die instantly when the monk gives the mental command for its heart to stop. Dang. The creature must have a heart or other organ for it to be stopped. I forgot about that part. I don't think I've ever actually read this, actually. I don't know if I've read Harmonic Touch before. Uh, the creature's bodily vibrations remain attuned to the monk for a period of one day per level of the monk, and if the monk does not have a mentally, does not mentally command the creature to die within this period of time, the death will not occur. Which, there's again another one-shot mechanic. So you get that at 13th level. Again, it is very hard to get a monk to these levels um, because it, it, I mean, it's just tough. They're, they're pretty weak, honestly. They, they like to fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat with 1d4 hit dice. I mean, you're rolling, you're rolling a d4 for your health. You're, you're going to go down really quickly if you are hit. Um, so just make sure that if you play a monk to be careful about that, but if not, you're pretty strong. I mean, you, you get a ton of really cool abilities. They're super versatile and can be really fun to play. I, I recommend it for maybe your second or third time around get a hang of the rules and then play a monk because they're so demanding role playing wise and combat wise. There's a lot to know. If you're a new player, biter is always recommended <laughs> right away. Um, easy paladin warriors of the light resolute against chaos and evil against for those who know what I'm talking about they can only be lawful good 21 minutes in and I have to take a sip of water apologies <laughs> strength is definitely what you want first right out of the gate um, paladins must be lawful alignment or they will revert to a fighter so if you do anything to break that alignment you're going back down to fighter whether you like it or not Again, like monks, you got to donate to temples or charities. You cannot keep excess money. Uh, paladins will not work with characters that are not lawful alignment unless ordered to do so by a superior officer of the paladin's order, by a lawful prince or high priest or priestess of a lawful temple. So keep that in mind when you're choosing your adventuring partners. Um, paladins are pretty cool because they get these awesome little abilities. Um, divine favor um uh they have a better saving throw chances um basically than anyone else um lay on hands uh you can lay on hands once per day to cure others of two uh hit points of damage per paladin level so one is two um two is four so on and so forth um or to cure disease if you're afflicted by more than one disease only one uh is affected per five levels so, you know, once you level up an, uh, another five times, you can do two diseases and so on and so forth. Uh, paladins are immune to diseases, so don't worry about having to use that on yourself. At any level, the character may summon a war horse that will arrive from the wilderness to serve a paladin as its steed. Um, it's un un unusually intelligent and extremely strong. Five hit dice. Um, if the horse is killed, the paladin may not summon another within a period of ten game years long time make sure your horse doesn't die at eighth level you can detect uh detect evil which is pretty cool you can detect evil um a stronghold at ninth level as well so you get you write your saving throws you get d8 hit dice which is awesome um you can also use any oh, i forgot to go over this part um any armor 
any weapons and only humans only humans on that one rangers okay you are basically <laughs> in my defense like the the one true hope of civilizations rangers are basically very um much the guardians of civilization and protector of the weak um, they are very good at hunting out monsters of chaos in wild places. Um, and in uh, battle, they are very good strategists. Uh, so rangers are very much in tune with nature, sort of like how druids are. Um, they, they can track enemies. They can use uh, melee weapons. They can use bows. There's a lot of really cool different things you can do with rangers. Um, inspiration from rangers. I know people uh, turn to Aragorn. Um, from the Lord of the Rings. Uh, Legolas and Aragorn sort of mixed together, in my opinion, are like the true epitome of a ranger. Uh, very intelligent, very skillful, can track very well, have a good head on their shoulders, know how to do the right thing for the right thing of mankind, so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, you're super well-versed in the wilderness. want to make sure I say that a lot. Uh, rangers must be and remain lawful. Uh, if not, fighters. You lose all your ranger abilities. Uh, you also get different titles. Uh, at 8th level, you get Ranger Knight. Um, at this point, certain class restrictions no longer apply. Um, their prime attribute is Strength. Um, hit dice, you get 2d8 at first level and 1d8 thereafter. So that is really awesome. <laughs> any armor, any weapons, but you can only be a human. Uh, charity, uh, you gotta give the charity anything that isn't needed to survive. Uh, when you become a ranger knight, the character may, um, not hire or accept any followers of any kind, not even lantern bearers or servants. They prefer to fetch their own ale at taverns. Um, so you you really are just sort of like a one-man show. Uh, associated with other rangers. Until the character reaches the status of ranger knight, a ranger may not operate in the concert with more than, more than one ranger. This does not restrict the ranger's membership in order of rangers. Um, it only restricts the number of rangers that kind of participate in a single or particular mission. Also, cool thing, um, you get um, spells as you level up as well. Uh, pretty good saving, you know, normal saving throw, your hit dice. Make sure you add that extra one at first level. And you can be a ranger knight, which is super cool. Uh, moving down, you get tracking. Uh, tracking is a bit funky, and I don't want to go over every specific one, but basically, uh, as you, you know, it, it's harder to track in cer certain places. I'll just leave that there. Um, a party containing a ranger is unlikely to be surprised. Uh, rangers are well trained to deal with giants, trolls, ogres, orcs, goblins, and kobolds. Against any of these sort of monsters, rangers gain plus one damage with a successful attack roll. Very cool. Scholar of Healing Magic, uh, basically this just talks about how at 8th level you can get clerical healing spells. Um, at ninth level, uh, Ranger uh, can use any and all magic items, um, and also you can use some magic user stuff. Uh, and at ninth level you also get your fortress, which is super cool. Um, you roll for your followers and, and have a bunch of fun with that. Uh, next up is Thief. I'm real quick going to go ahead... Oop didn't mean to do that back up back it up uh thieves okay so as we talked about assassins earlier thieves are the more true thieves um so uh you get a couple different abilities than than uh assassins do um and you're also better at the thieving abilities than monks or assassins um your prime attribute is dex um 1d4 uh leather armor no shield um any weapons but magical weapons are limited to daggers and swords and you can be any race Pretty cool. Pretty versatile there. Uh, thieves are experts basically in stealth and delicate tasks. Um, they really are, are amazing at stealing things, um, sneaking around on enemies, um, stuff like that. You know, general. Uh, at, you can backstab as well. You gain a plus four to hit from behind and inflict double damage. At levels uh, five to eight, double damage is tripled, and any above eight you do quadruple damage. So you do just a lot of damage if you can get behind that target. Pretty awesome. Plus two on saving throws against devices including traps, magical wands, or staves, um, or other magical devices. Um, read normal languages at third level. 
Thieves of their level can figure out the gist of most written languages that have an 80% chance to comprehend treasure or maps written on documents, so you're pretty good at deciphering puzzles, deciphering codes. At ninth level, uh, you can decipher magical writings, um, although not divine, just magical, ar arcane in nature, um, but your understanding is not perfect. So, Thieves can also cast magic user spells from scrolls, but uh, high level chance at high level there's a 10% chance um, for a very unpredictable dangerous outcome uh, and at ninth level you get your guild so there's your thieving chart as well um, and and non-humans um, get some uh, pluses um, depending on what is going on uh, so that sort of incentivizes maybe not playing a human maybe you if you, if you really want to be um, someone who can hide and move around well. Halfling is definitely where you want to go. Elves as well. Um, dwarves are better with delicate tasks and traps. Um, but halflings are generally the most recommended because, I mean, just look at that. Look at that bonus. That's pretty awesome. Um, here's your advancement table. So as your saving throw is 1d4, you definitely want to stay in the back. Um, and that pretty much wraps it up for the character class. Now, um, I'm sorry if I breezed over some stuff. Um, you know, just so these videos aren't an hour long, um, I might be going a little quickly on some things. Um, that, of course, can be answered. Any of your questions, you know, if I went over stuff too quickly, go ahead and leave them down in the uh, comment section down below, and I'll be happy to answer anything. Um, there's also Swords and Wizardry groups on Facebook if you want to communicate more with your Swords and Wizardry friends out there. Go check those out. Just check Swords and Wizardry groups on Facebook, and those will easily come up. Make sure to leave a like on this video. I I, uh, I really do enjoy um, when I get a lot of likes. It definitely helps the channel grow, and it makes the analytics look awesome. So I really appreciate anyone leaving likes on these videos. Comment down below, of course, any questions or comments that you have. I really enjoy making these videos. I really like doing this long-form content. Um, so if you enjoy it, please let us know in the comments. And subscribe for more content, of course, as always. And that's it for today. I mean, I mean that we we covered a lot in thirty minutes, a lot of stuff. So, um, I will be continuing with these videos uh, over time, and I'm super excited to talk about the rest of the rulebook. Super excited. Um, that's all from me. Thank you so much for watching. Keep those rolls and spirits high, and we'll see you next time.